Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming here. I know we're the last talk on the last day, and people are kind of tired. Um, so we're going to have a lot of fun in this talk. Woo. We're going to have some energy. Nice. Yay! <laughs> Woo! Uh, I'm not going to dance or sing. <laughs> Neither. No. Those things aren't going to happen. No. So, um, I'll do some quick introductions. I'll start with myself. My name is Paula Kennedy. I am the director for the Pivotal Cloud Foundry Solutions team, Pivotal, based in London. There's lots of my team here, which is nice to see. Uh, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, and I'll start with Deborah. Thank you. Howdy. So, hi, I am Deborah Wood. I am the product manager for the cloud operations team in Dublin. Uh, we run uh, the platform for Pivotal Tracker in production, and for the sport relief campaign, we supplied the platform for uh, the donations uh, web application that received all the donations. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Shane Houston, engineering manager with Pivotal, uh, also on the, the cloud ops team in Dublin. Cool. I'm Zenon Hanek. I work for Arma Cooney. We're a software consultancy specializing in cloud native transformation. And I'm the COO, so I do all of the crap. Nice. Uh, and I'm Caroline Rennie. I'm the product lead at Comic Relief. Um, so we're sort of the client of all these great people. <laughs> OK, thank you, everybody. So I'm going to start with a question for Caroline. Uh, you mentioned you work for Comic Relief. Could you tell us a little bit about what Comic Relief is? Um, and really just give us a bit of a detail on the problem statement that you were trying to solve for. Yeah, so, um, so Comic Relief is a major UK charity. Um, we raise money and then distribute it around, around the world to different projects, um, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa and the UK, but in other places too. Um, we use the learnings from these different projects that we fund, because um, you know, a girl in the gang in London has very similar experiences to people in um, a similar situation in South Africa. So we're able to spread the learnings that we get from giving this money out across the world. Um, but first, we have to give them the money. So um, we have a major fundraising event every year. It's either Sport, Sport Relief or Red Nose Day, and that broadcast from BBC One. Um, it's seven hours, and it raises about 90% of our public donations. Um, so we have quite a high risk appetite <laughs> comic relief um, because if you know even if you've got a provider who's promising you the uh, five nines if we have five minutes of out outage after a really effective um, appeal film then that loses us millions of pounds um, so that was our problem <laughs> is that we need a really highly resilient platform which is capable of taking huge amounts of traffic um, so usually up to about, I think we do capability up to about 500 donations per second. Um, and it needs to work within the seven hour period. And if it doesn't, then we will not be able to you know, fund fantastic projects around the world. Um, so obviously, as a good product and development team, we outsource it for a while. Uh, so that's where we got uh, our Macunian. Yeah, so we originally uh, rewrote the platform seven years ago. It's a uh, microservices-based architecture, 26 different microservices. Um, it uses kind of um, a stateless, uh, stateless pattern, and it's a virtually consistent pattern, so we can take the money even if certain elements of the platform fail. And we've been doing it for a number of years, and so originally we built it on the open source Cloud Foundry and ran across a private vSphere environment and AWS, ran it across just AWS for a couple of years, then did and then uh, partnered with, with uh, Pivotal over the last couple of years and been running it across PCF and made some changes this year. So you mentioned you made some changes. Um, Shane, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of what the actual implementation this year looked like? Sure. Um, so as Zenon said, last year the uh, applications were hosted across a mixture of AWS and GCP. And this year we decided to focus totally on GCP for the Night of TV. Um, this was partially because we'd um, built up a lot of experience um, between last year's Comic Relief event and also migrating Pivotal Tracker onto GCP in the previous year before that. Um, so for this year, we actually had three foundations running across two regions on GCP. Uh, one of those foundations was a pre-prod environment where we could test a few things out before pushing into production. And then we had our redundancy in our production environments. Okay, um, and what else was kind of different this year? Because you've done it a few times, right? We have, yeah. So 
We used it as an opportunity to allow, it was a bit of an experiment for us as, as operations. We wanted to allow internal pivotal teams to directly interact with the users of their products. So typically feedback going into pivotal products like Redis or uh, in this instance, PKS actually, which is one of our new, newly released um, products. We wanted to allow our product teams to talk directly to app developers who are the users to build empathy and to understand the use cases. So typically, there would not be a, a direct relationship. So we allowed um, our Makuni engineers uh, direct access to the teams, and they were um, also involved in uh, like fire drills just to practice incident management. That was different. Okay. So you mentioned PKS, which yes. uh, is new for Pivotal and uh, something I want to hear a bit more about. Really? So uh, Shane, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, so I'm sure by now probably everyone is familiar with the concept of PKS, but it's the Pivotal Container Service, um, which provides uh, Kubernetes run by Bosch in the system. Um, at the time of the, com of the Sport Relief event, uh, PKS was a fairly new product. Um, we were actually as far as I'm aware, we were the first uh, place using it in production for, for the Sport Relief event. Yeah. Um, we were using it for this event to host uh, instances of MongoDB. Um, these instances were something that had existed previously. They were used uh, last year as well, but there was a difference in the setup between last year and this year in that regard. We were using a Bosch deployment for Mongo previously, but we needed to tweak it in a number of ways in order to use it across multiple AZs. And also, when we came back to it uh, this year, we found that the deployment hadn't been updated in a very long time and we weren't so confident in using it. So PKS provided us a very uh, good use case for hosting this, this new workflow. Okay, and so Caroline, you're obviously a customer of all of this development effort. How did it go? Yeah, so we got all the money, which is great. That's um, <laughs> <laughs> all yeah. we care about. Yeah. Um, but it's also that we had the confidence that, um, so we don't just receive online donations, we also get you know, text donations and people calling up still. Um, and we just had the confidence that if something changed in the system, we knew that the teams had worked really closely together to make sure that monitoring was coming back. You know, if it's a two-minute gap, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, and we knew that the communications between Armacuni um, and Pivotal was just great to make sure that if there was a problem, it was yeah. fixed super quick. And there wasn't a problem, but we were very, very comfortable. I don't know that Xenon keeps using the term that he was really bored, but as it's an entertainment show, he was very entertained. Uh, <laughs> and not having to think about work is how we'd rephrase it. I actually got to watch a TV show, yeah. which you don't usually get to watch uh, in a high-profile event like this. So, yeah, so from our perspective, it just worked. So it's quite interesting because originally the, uh, we had a single team that was developing the app, also supported Cloud Foundry as well, so supporting the platform and the app, and that worked really well for us. And then when we... Uh, partnered with Pivotal, that kind of changed. So Pivotal were the platform support team, we were the kind of dev apps, uh, uh, development team for the apps themselves. And so that kind of created a kind of separation <coughs> of duty. And then this year with having the Cloud Ops team in Dublin supporting uh, the platform, but also having the PKS team involved, it kind of created a kind of triangle that we needed to kind of cover across in terms of communications and fire drills and trying and just essentially building up trust between, between the teams. It worked fine on the night. We, uh, we believe greatly in our observability for all of our platforms, for all our, for our apps, and we managed to ensure by working really hard before the night that we all knew what was going on in the platform. We all had really real clarity of what issues, what they look like when they arise and what that might mean, and then what actions we need to take off the back of that. Mm. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a very successful evening. So, so just digging a little bit more into the, the support that the CloudOps team provided and that platform, I mean, Shane described a bit about having PKS and PAS both uh, kind of combined together for that platform. Uh, as the app kind of team, did you notice any difference? Could you see like that there was multiple pieces involved in the platform? No, so it, it, th there was no difference really. It was kind of like there's an endpoint that we call for our Mongo calls and they just go through. And so in the original setup, when, <coughs> when, they, when we originally set out, there was a, some small configuration that needed to be done on the GCP load balancer to kind of enable traffic to flow through at a higher rate. But that was picked up probably within the first kind of kind of uh, first load test that we did together. Mm -hmm. On that, the change was made, and then it was it was um, yeah it it was completely um, transparent to us. There was nothing there that we needed to know, cool. and that's really for me that's almost been it's sort of been the 
for us, it's been the promise of, 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 of Cloud Foundry that has been the same for, you know, we've, hardly, we've made one change in the, in the seven years that we used Cloud Foundry, and I think it was something to do with one year with a, between when we went to Cloud Foundry 2.0, one of the namespaces changed or something needed, no. needed change. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, it's just remained entirely consistent, and you can just trust the platform will do what it wants to do. And what was quite interesting for us is we expected it to be a much, much more effort on our side. We genuinely expected, right, it's, it's Mongo, but it's running on PKS. There's going to be something we're going to need to do differently. We're going to have to route something differently. We're going to have to mess around with some configuration on our side. But we didn't. It just worked. And so it was very interesting for us how low friction it was as a kind of um, development team to engineering team to support that kind of transition to PKS. And Shane, how was the experience of using PKS? Because you mentioned you're one of the early kind of sure. people to use it in production. How was it? Uh, it was very straightforward. We, we did uh, manage to pair a lot with the PKS team in order to get some more experience because <coughs> on Cloud Ops we had never used Kubernetes before, we never used PKS before, so we did get some information from, from those folks. Um, but it was, it was very straightforward. Um, and to, to touch back on Xenon's point, it's very much the intention of PKS that these things will be perfectly transparent to the end user. And for, for us in the PKS team, it was very validating to actually test that out in a production scenario and see that it was, yeah. uh, that, that workflow was, was working as expected. Okay, so Carolyn and Xenon said it went okay on the night. How was it on the night for you two? Delightfully boring. <laughs> <laughs> was, um, we, we got there, uh, we, they had a, we had a war room kind of set up with, with monitors, both of us monitoring direct uh, our, our platform's behavior directly. We used one of our products called HealthWatch, just out of curiosity value. It's got all sorts of interesting graphs, and it was also a new, newish product at the time. So uh, we had Amakuni's um, monitoring that was actually showing number of concurrent users at any particular time, and you could see the number go up and down based on the videos that were being shown. And then it was actually quite like out of curiosity value, just to look at health watch and say, oh yes, the requests have gone up and they're going, but everything's still green, so I'm happy. Um, so yeah, we were, we were able to, it was actually very, very interesting to see how the two teams were monitoring everything, but there was, there was nothing dramatic, there was no panic stations. Okay, so that sounds good, but it also sounds like a lot of sitting, Eyeball. staring at <laughs> monitors. I mean, is that, that usual for your team? It's definitely uh, an anti-pattern, I would say. Yeah. Um, we, we were more so doing it on the night out of curiosity, uh, especially to yeah. see these kind of peaks in, in usage of the apps and seeing that things yeah. were being handled correctly. Yeah. But in, in general, uh, our, our approach on Cloud Ops is more so to have alerting based around this monitoring so that we yeah. can find out that there's a problem without having to stare at these screens. Exactly. And it's actually, um, it's often very difficult to fight the temptation of like watching something like Healthwatch <laughs> and seeing the graph and wanting to dive in <laughs> straight away. <laughs> like there's some interesting thing happening, you need to know what, what it was, but actually yeah. if it doesn't affect the running apps, it really isn't uh, all, all that important. I think also for sustainability of operations teams, you don't want to be burning people out. So it's very important to understand what the most important workflows are for your users, so in terms of like SLIs and SLOs, so mm -hmm. service level indicators, which is your probe, and service level objectives, which is your, your, um, your required uh, performance. And you don't, like, you, don't write, you don't do alerting on a CPU bump, or a CPU, you do alerting on we could not serve the donations form. So you, you alert on the thing that needs a human to interact with, to address, and to fix. So one of the things that we care about quite deeply in my team is that the, the, the human ops aspect of operations, you don't want to be burning people out. Um, so yes. Like you've been hanging out with Hannah Fox well a bit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you don't want someone at 2 o'clock in the morning having to stare at a dashboard, to stare at HealthWatch. Um, if you don't need my attention, I'd rather be sleeping. So <laughs> if you do need my attention, you can page me. So that's kind of how we try and <coughs> monitor uh, the attention and the, the energy of our, our, our well, staff. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add that Comic Relief did supply snacks so that yes. people who had to stare at their screens for seven hours didn't go crazy. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I think it was, you know, there was a point where we were like, you can probably stop looking now. It feels safe. <laughs> yeah. We were also staring at the BBC yeah. screen as well. We were yeah, yeah, yeah. entertained by that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I want to maybe open it up to the audience if there's any questions. You talked about wanting to be uh, highly available, uh, but you also talked about you, you'd previously worked 
across two cloud providers and then moved to just one yes. cloud provider. I'm just wondering, what was your motivation behind that? And how did you ensure that you, you kept that high availability with just the one provider? Do you want me to take that one? <laughs> I think it's just a, a sort of logistical idea around cost uh, was, whilst high availability is obviously super important to Comic Relief, after five years of seeing us, you know, we're doing multi-region as well, so realistically we sort of had multi-region, multi-cloud, and you're thinking, do you know what, if, if at the moment if this platform's gone down, it's because the entire internet is broken, um, and so just in the feasibility and, you know, maintaining a platform across two, you know, it was just making the platform itself a bit too complicated for what was now becoming our emerging needs. Um, so, yeah, I think it was also, you know, finding great tech partners to work with and being able to go and say, yep, we'd be happy with all the eggs being in this basket. Sure. Yeah, I think it comes down to a risk assessment each year. So, originally, one of the main aims of the platform was to, be, uh, to not have dependency on a particular technology provider. So, it, the old platform, like eight plus years ago, was built with kind of 12, 13 different technology partners. I could probably reel off the names, but you probably know them. All the big players came together used to get a kit from HP, stick it in a data center, all kind of get about 35, 40 people together and build this, build this kind of snowflake of an app mm. and hope that it works. Um, and then every year we had to make an assessment as to what the risks were. So when we first did it six, seven years ago, you know, AWS was well established, but it still was something that was, you know, there weren't that many regions. We had to do US East uh, and, and US West, West Coast for the first, the first time. And so as time went on, and then we did eight across AWS and GCP, and we just found that GCP was, was, was really solid. And every year, exactly that kind of extra cost of running up, uh, you know, a, a different environment and, and with a different cloud provider and having to, you know, load test that, monitor that, make sure that's okay. We just made a decision that practically the risk was such that we could, we could work with a single <coughs> provider. I think as well, from Pivotal's perspective, mm -hmm. we'd had uh, a year's experience of running tra uh, Pivotal Tracker on top of GCP, and we were very confident in the, the setup for that. For Tracker in particular, we only have a single foundation on GCP, and we've mm -hmm. been... Uh, working very well and as expected with that. Uh, mm -hmm. So from our perspective, having these three foundations was already adding a lot of redundancy uh, to this setup for the night of TV. And on top of that, um, I mentioned that there was one pre-prod environment and two production environments. But we had the pre-prod environment set up exactly like one of the production environments. So mm -hmm. if there was any kind of outage for one of those or if there was uh, some sudden peak in demand, we could very easily route traffic to the, the pre-prod setup as well. <laughs> Hello, I wanted to see if anyone else, I don't, I no, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then you may have explained this, but it was a bit fast. The, the Mongo uh, running in PKS did, so was that just still connecting to the applications through standard service broker interface? Um, I just want to make sure that there wasn't anything unusual there. Um, is that a fair description? Uh, yeah, so it, it just connected normally like, as, it did, as it did before, so it was just a, a same interface as it would be if it was on PCF. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So really that's not a lot of change. No. Yeah, well, there wasn't yeah, correct. any change from our side. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So zero change to the application. Zero change to the application. Yeah. Just there. checking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Howdy. Hey, hey Josh. I had a question then again about Mongo. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the Bosch deployed Mongo hadn't been updated. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe there was an implicit thing that the Kubernetes Mongo was more up to date. Um, I don't know, maybe if that's true or not, it would be interesting to know. But what, what else changed for like monitoring your Mongo? Like, uh, I'm guessing, you know, did you have to change anything around how you made sure that service was running? Um, when it was running on different infrastructure? Uh, in terms of the Kubernetes side, uh, I, I believe that the, the MongoDB Elm charts were more up-to-date than the bus deployment, um, partially because there's so much attention focusing on Kubernetes right now, and it is a, a good solution for these like third-party uh, data providers that aren't necessarily cloud-native by design. Mm -hmm. um, 
We didn't do any additional monitoring from the, the cloud ops side we of didn't. that. I'm not sure if there was anything. It, it was the same monitoring as it had been the year before in terms of that. We had the same kind of graphs, like Grafana graphs were kind of reading, you know, the amount of throughput going in, you know, queues and all that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. but like I said, for us, uh, in terms of a risk perspective, the MongoDB can, can go away and we'd still be collecting all of the money. It would just fall into the Redis queues and then the queues would just build up. And then what we can do is we can Re, we can rerun the whole night again and repopulate the MongoDB so you can get the state of, of time at any, at any point. Mm. So we've never had to do that, thankfully, but, um, but that is something that we have in our kind of back pocket. It makes reporting much, much harder because the reporting comes off the, Mo the MongoDB. So we send, uh, every minute we're sending, uh, uh, we're, we're calling a dashboard that, that we have that the people, who are monitoring, the people who are watching the TV show and the finance team are monitoring the dashboard that's telling them how much yeah. money's come in so that then because you have to, when we're giving out totals on the BBC TV show, they have to be uh, validated and complied by our finance team. So we have to have m numerous checks that we're not, we're not giving the wrong number uh, to, the, to the BBC because that causes them uh, a massive, <laughs> massive compliance problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there's um, certain levels of sort of assumed failure rates as well just applied to that because you then say, whilst all of our systems are saying, yeah, this money definitely exists, you don't want somebody to turn around in two weeks' time and say, credit card fraud, or I only meant to put one zero um, <laughs> when they put three. Um, so <laughs> there's, um, there's a few other things just to make sure that we, because yeah, we've got very tight compliance rules with the BBC, which is great fun to work with technology. I have another question. <clears throat> um, on, when you were doing the risk assessment and you were looking at the solution for this year, can I ask why PKS? Was it just because it was shiny and new and you wanted to try it out? Was it to solve a particular thing that was new? Like, what was the motivation for thinking you'd, you'd add PKS into the mix? I think from Pivotal's perspective, we were certainly interested in uh, testing it out. It had been something that had been worked on for quite some time and this was a kind of perfect scenario where it's a workload that would fit very nicely into that picture for PKS. Uh, I'm not sure if there was more I mean, I mean, for us, um, a big part of uh, the journey that Comic Relief has made is to become a technology destination. You know, they want, uh, you've got, uh, they're hiring. Oh, yeah. They've got, they've, got a great, <laughs> they've, got, they've got a great team. They've got, they're really making a real difference in the world, doing some really, really cool stuff. They're, uh, you know, they're um, doing some really interesting stuff in serverless and all these kind of things. And so for us, part of it is always looking at what's out there and what we could okay. potentially use. Mm -hmm. Now, um, for us, it comes down to a conversation that we had with Pivotal and Pivotal saying, this is, this is kind of GA now, we've got great confidence in it, we'd like to yeah. use it, assessing what the risks are uh, within that yeah. and trialing it by getting yeah. it up early, by working really closely with Pivotal, then we can try and load test it and see if it works. Yeah. If it didn't work, then we could go back to, you know, uh, spinning up in, in, in open source CF, spinning up in, in PCF and, and working through the problems of that. But early, fast feedback to validate the question really, really starts giving reassurance. And it's kind of something that the project has had all the way through. So when we originally did it, two weeks after we agreed with uh, Contracts Comic Relief that we were going to build the platform, we presented the first journey. And it was just a three pages. Didn't look very nice, but it was actually money flowing into Comic Relief's bank. And the directors at the time, the board of Comic Relief at that point, were making, it was a massive risk for them. For them to be able to see progress within two weeks, mm be able to see money flowing in was re very reassuring. So that's something that as an ethos that we've carried on all the way through, you know, testing and validating as quickly as possible. And that just fits in with all the kind of pivotal practices and XP, et cetera. So it's worked really well. How did you do um, scaling? Did you plan for the maximum expected load and just scaled statically? Or did, was there auto scaling involved? Um, we, uh, we can't auto scale. And it's something that's had even from the first solution. Um, the spikes are so spiky. So we have the seven hour TV show. We show, um, we show uh, films that show the impact of the money and literally the, you can see from the, the, se yeah. you know, the, second, yeah. the second the film yeah. finishes and they ask people to donate, it just, it just spikes. And so with, you, know, with, you can't really use ELBs because then they'll, you know, the first one will say, oh, I'm running out of things, let me get another one. They'll say, oh, I'm running out of things, let me get the other one. And suddenly you're waiting and waiting and waiting. So we have to pre-scale and pre-warm um, pre stuff. Yeah, and that's another nice thing about working with partners who are bought into the cause because, you know, obviously it's, um, it's more expensive to do that, but it's also worth it and your risk and reward because uh, 
yeah, and so it's also very difficult for us to say you're going to have this much traffic because it's just literally like it's broadcast. So it's you don't know how many people are watching, you don't know which films will land. So we often will over, we're very, very mm -hmm. much on the cautious side because, yeah, yeah it's, it's mission critical for us. Hi. Um, seems it was a pretty successful night uh, last time around. What's going to change for the next time around? Um, we are actually taking um, the donation platform in-house and we are building it using AWS Lambda Serverless. Um, which was, this is our breakup with Alma Cooney on stage. I'm sorry, oh, no. it's, just, uh, it's, it's not you, it's us. <laughs> from, my, from my perspective, I think it's really amazing because mm. ultimately what we try to do, I think what Pivotal tries to do as, as kind of responsible technical partners is you want to engage with the, your client and get them up to speed as quickly as possible. So a lot of the patterns that we have in the, in the application, you know, the, the, the queuing, the eventual consistency, the kind of stateless nature of, of each of the, each of the, um, of the calls, um, they've taken that on, they've taken that learning, and now they're building it in-house. Mm -hmm. And the, it's just the nature of, of, of kind of technology that things move on and things change. And for us to be able to, you know, and we, we recently went to Comic Relief and spent a couple of days with them to help them validate the, the application, the new application, and that was just, it was just great being part of that and seeing a team really taking, taking that on. Yeah, and it's also sort of because of the annual cycle of it's once a year, um, we used to sort of work in a way where for six months or four, four to six months of the year, you're working on it and then you sort of retire it and then things can get out of date. So that's sort of how probably how the Mongo problem existed. Um, she says confidently. Um, so the difference now is that we're actually changing our business model as on the whole to try and do more year-round activity and for us to be able to have a platform which can scale when it needs to scale and shrink back down when it needs to shrink back down. Again, very technical terms. Um, that's perfect for us um, and it's just been a great experience for our development team um, to take all these learnings, which have been you know, seven years worth of learnings, and then go and do this chaos testing day with, with you guys. And you've been like, yeah, you've covered off most of the things, which means that we're, we're significantly, our team, I think, we do, we've not got, had the horror, horror experience that Xenon had in 2011. <laughs> so we've never seen their platform fail. So we're like, well, the platform's always fine, so we can do this. So I think that we're very <laughs> yeah. much now being like, we must make sure that ours doesn't. So we're about to get a lot yeah. more. Um, I'm sure all of that, all, anyone who's been an engineer has a, some scar tissue that <laughs> kind of reminds them of some lessons they need, to, they need to keep in their mind. So I've got one question then. Just, it sounds like you get to do a lot of experimenting and kind of pushing the boundaries on the technology front. Have you had a chance to kind of, I guess, give back to the community as far as like lessons learned or tips or tricks or even maybe there's other... Um, you know, agencies out there that could use the same technology? Is that kind of something you, you think about? Um, so we've, we use Drupal for our main CMS, so we give back to that community currently. Um, there's other platforms that we have got out in the open. So, for example, our gift aid claims um, are all also on AWS Lambda. Um, so we, like, so when you text to donate, you need to click a link and give us details so we can gift aid it. We're like, that's only useful for charities and let's share that out. So it's accessible, it's out there, github.com forward slash comic relief. You can go and look at our work, you can contribute to our work if you really want to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we try and give back to the community a lot and I think from the time that the platform's been in development, these comic relief have been represented at probably every Cloud Foundry <laughs> um, talk. So there's a lot yeah. of feeding back into the community, definitely. Yeah. And I, I'd say part of our learnings was there was understandable reluctance uh, just with the distributed nature of what we were doing. So we had three very specialized teams. We had Armakuni specializing in using MongoDB. We had my team, Cloud Operations, specialized in running a PCF stably. And that's, that's our domain and we know it inside out. And then we had PKS with their speciality of running Kubernetes. And the, one, of the, one of the earlier talks today was around given that there are three very specialist teams working together to provide this platform, there's, there's a reluctance for any one of those teams to hold the hot potato of support for that thing. So there was reluctance just in terms of who can adequately uh, take um, operational responsibility for MongoDB on the native TV. 
understandably, um, because while Amakuni was on top of their MongoDB game, the fact that we were running it on PKS um, meant that while they know how to fix MongoDB, they might not be able to get there. They might not be able to find... Uh, so one of the lessons that we learned that was actually very, very helpful was that we decided to share operational responsibility across the three teams, and we practiced that. So for us to get uh, aligned on who handles an incident on Night of TV, we set up fire drills, so we practiced, uh, let's get everybody on the same Zoom call, everybody on the sl same Slack channel, and we just practiced access region one of production, get the last line on the log file of MongoDB, give me a number of records in this DB, all that kind of stuff just to build confidence between the three teams. And that was a very simple but very pragmatic way to make teams feel less afraid on something as high profile as a night of TV. I think in the, in the IT world that we live in with so many very different specialist niche areas like a microservices world where you have to collaborate with teams that you might not know, practicing incident management uh, in, in, in the line of something like fire drills can just help um, alleviate the fear factor in operations teams. And we learned that and we, we're trying to spread the gospel of fire drills in Pivotal um, and anyone who will listen. But um, it actually worked very well. And it wasn't, it wasn't a super technical solution. It was just um, let people practice logging into the right thing and getting a simple thing so they're not terrified. <laughs> awesome. So we're just about out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> Good job, team. All right.